Hello, and welcome to this, the Books Crypto Club weekly catch up on Zoom. It's Sunday, the 4th of April, 2022. And today we're going to talk about whatever the audience want to talk about, really. We sometimes talk about cryptocurrencies, pricing, trading, algorithmic bots, whatever on that, uh, DeFi, NFTs, ICOs, STOs, and any other three letter acronym. It really depends upon what people who come along want to talk about. It's open to all. We have novices and experts alike who come and join us. For beginners, this is great as it gives an opportunity for them to ask really basic, simple questions. For the more experienced people, it might be that they want to share some information, some knowledge, some experience, and everyone is welcome. So come along, join in. If you enjoy this, don't forget to click on the subscribe button, like the video, make comments. Even better, come along to a future event. So this week we get to talk about some basics. We talk about uh, cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens, and there's a difference between the two. And I explain how wallets work to, to some level. So if you don't know about paper wallets, hardware wallets, USB drives, secure devices, this could be a really interesting session for you to stick around and watch. If you're particularly new to the crypto world, and you're struggling with some of the terms and that, then stick around because we, we explain some basics. We go back to some really simple questions, really interesting stuff. Hope you enjoy this. Do subscribe, do click on like, do make comments if you'd like to learn more about particular things. Do come along to a future session. I'll include details of how to uh, attend a future meeting in the link below. See who's going to come and join us today. <laughs> hey, Sandy. <laughs> Hello, good evening and welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Gary. Uh, well, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, you know busy last two weeks, but uh, yeah, not not a problem. Good, good to see you again. Thank and you. Michael, I think Michael's managed to join us now. He was having some connection problems before. Hi, Michael. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Seems to be always the thing at the beginning of these sessions where people get all sorts of connection problems and this kind of thing. So, no problem. So, Sandy, what what we've been learning in the crypto world? Anything interesting last few weeks? Not really, not really. Just um, you know, looking at the some rise in the you know the crypto, uh, you know the values, but uh, nothing apart from that. Okay, because it's interesting. Certainly, I noticed that Bitcoin has been um, he heading up quite nicely of late, and I guess the, the rest of the crypto market's been following suit. So it's been interesting on that. Yeah, it is. It is, and also I'm, I'm not quite getting. Or oh, what is a dash uh, coin? Is it similar to Bitcoin, or is any any different purpose? You mean comparing which coin to which? Sorry, sorry, dash coin. Dash. Yeah. yeah. So it really comes down to um, cryptocurrencies are designed around blockchains that fulfill different purposes, and so for dash. Um, I think they're more in the gaming space, if I remember correctly, uh, oh, okay. and, and possibly payments as well. But the reality is, if you're just looking to trade to make money out of things going up in price, the actual purpose, that despite every, everyone will tell you, go and read the white paper, learn about what the vision is, look at what the team is. Actually, for most crypto coins, that actually really doesn't apply. Um, so it doesn't make that much difference as to whether it's Bitcoin, which is about payments, or Ethereum, which is about programmability, or Dash, which is about faster processing, or Monero, which is about privacy. They've, they've all got these different things, but ultimately it's about what's causing the price to go up and down. And there's no correlation whatsoever as to what it is and what uh, it is. Yeah. yeah okay, got it, yeah. So it, it's certainly something, because I, I, I get a lot where people say, well, you know, should I be looking at going into um, Litecoin, for example, because that's quite good on the, on the payment side of things, or Bitcoin Cash, um, because that, that um, is much faster than Bitcoin. The reality is, if you, if you look at the prices and you look at the charts, there's no kind of a obvious correlation as to which are the good ones to go for or the bad ones. But you will get people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, read the paper, learn about the team, all this kind of thing. I actually think for most people who are just trying to get into this space, it doesn't greatly matter. Okay, okay, got it. But what, what, where's your interest in Dash? Have you been reading about it or something? 
and there is you know sharp rise some at some point as well in the you know dash coin so just i'm just curious you know what, what it does is uh, so okay yeah and also i mean just want to ask something like you know just the overall the crypto world how far the usage has been in the market for the crypto do, do we know any anything about that so it depends what you mean by usage so if you look at the market capitalization of cryptocurrency at the moment i i can't remember the exact number but imagine it's around about 2 trillion dollars or something in terms of if you add the value of all cryptocurrencies and all the crypto tokens there so it's about 2 trillion dollars which sounds like a really big number until you take a look at uh, traditional financial services so the banking sector the hedge funds the asset managers the pension funds you know the volume of trading per day is in trillions if not beyond and the total market capitalization of everything to do with crypto is 2 trillion so it's tiny compared to the financial markets and this is where i find it really exciting because i think crypto is only at the beginning of its journey if you look at how small it is compared to the traditional financial markets was that the kind of thing you were thinking of or something different yeah yeah i mean my my that's one thing you know on the capitalization side that's not quite you know correlate with the business usage as well the crypto so my question is the business usage side on the crypto so you know what are the big businesses are accepting crypto so that, that's the kind of information i'm looking so. okay so if we look at that the, there's two ways in which businesses are dealing with crypto well there's, there's three as far as i'm aware uh, one is where they're simply saying yes we accept bitcoin we accept whatever uh, for payment there aren't many companies that do that okay so you, if you walk into starbucks you know er everything is priced in pounds euros dollars or whatever you don't see a price list generally with bitcoin or litecoin or anything like that mentioned and that's true certainly in the uk and most of europe um, there's some places in switzerland where it might be a little bit different and there's a few places in london you know i've, I've been to a burger bar where things are priced in crypto and I've been to a bar that accepts crypto. They, they accepted Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and a Litecoin, I think it was. And they actually had, you know, if you want to pint a lager, it was this price or this kind. So there are outbreaks of that in the UK, but there's not that much. Elsewhere in the world, you know, if you go to El Salvador, where it's now a um, considered legal tender or parts of even Argentina and South America, it's more widely accepted. So th th that's the first thing of... Um, you know, how many well-known brands accept crypto and pricing crypto? And the answer is not many at all. Okay. The second area is where they use some sort of gateway where you, they may not realize they are accepting payments in crypto. So you might have a crypto credit card or something. And, and there's a few on the market now whereby when you pay, and it's a bit like using a Revolut card. With Revolut these days, you don't actually know what currency you're paying in. You know, it's just they are being paid in somewhere. And so there are cards, I think Crypto.com do one, and Luno um, is a, a wallet provider in the UK. Uh, I think Ziglu might be the same or a wallet provider in the UK. And these are all facilities where you can buy and sell things. And what happens is that there is an intermediary um, like a third-party broker or whatever, who converts your crypto into fiat at the point of purchase. So it kind of looks as though you're using crypto, but you're not quite. So you, to, to you, you've got crypto wallets and it says you've paid in crypto, but what actually happens is it converts the crypto into fiat currency and then pays the merchant. There's a lot more of that, and a lot of people don't even realize that they're doing it. The third area is where companies are explicitly using cryptocurrencies as part of a blockchain layer. So they're using it for their payment rails and so on. This is what the banks are doing. So this is where you've got the likes of uh, Ripple, the, the organization, not XRP, which is the cryptocurrency, but Ripple have built like payment gateways and platforms and that, which use their platform. Uh, JP Morgan have done something with 
um, a blockchain platform called Quorum, and Quorum has got a cryptocurrency with it, so it's it's native within that. So you get certain companies who are using crypto into company or into bank or whatever uh, as a payment rail, but you don't see that as a consumer. They're using it for interbank settlements or whatever type of thing. So the, the three kind of main areas. The, the first is where everyone knows that they're using crypto and everything's priced in crypto, and there aren't that many of those. Then there's the ones where you're using some sort of intermediary where you think you're using crypto and they don't even realize that the origination was crypto. So it's, it's a bit like having a, a bank account that's in US dollars, but they instantly convert it to pounds at the point at which you're buying something. So it looks like you're paying in dollars, but you're not. And then the third one is the likes of JP Morgan, um, Ripple, and a number of others who are using cryptocurrencies as part of their payment rails. And there's a lot of that going on in the banking sector at the moment. Um, but you probably won't even know about it because they don't particularly advertise it. Does, does that help give a kind of a... Oh, yeah, flavor? yeah. I mean, it does, it does. Thank you, yeah. Mm. I think when, when it comes to the third one where the banks, I think they are they using actually cryptocurrencies or are they using the blockchain technology? So, so the, they're using both. So JP Morgan, for example, when they are using Quorum, so Quorum is the blockchain layer and in fact it's the blockchain protocol and it has a native cryptocurrency that they, they can use within it so that, that that's an example of be, that being done um ripple they've got ripple and ripple nets and they are using xrp as well so they are blockchain platforms usually with a cryptocurrency layer on top then you've also got other companies not necessarily in the banking sector uh, and this is the, the domain i operate in uh, I do some stuff with insurance companies and that, where we're using blockchains to track goods and services or products or whatever, where we're actually using the blockchain as a ledger of trust. So it it's, um, allows you to do traceability of where goods have come from or where they've gone to. It allows you to do traceability on payments, uh, use it for identity management. Um, and this is where smart contracts start coming into their own as well. So smart contract, it's just a posh name for a computer program, but it's a computer program that's running on a blockchain that can automatically execute when it detects an event happening. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that space. So I'm, I'm an advisor to a blockchain based platform, which provides um, insurance services. Uh, and there's a number of other companies in the insurance sector are doing that as well. You've got things like um, EtherRisk who are, uh, quite a mature startup now, they've been around for, I think it's about five years, doing things like flight delay insurance, where you've got, they've developed a smart contract and if your flight is delayed, you'll automatically get um, a refund on that. So there's a lot of stuff going on in that space. And that, um, that tends to be kept a little bit quieter. I, I, I keep saying to people who are saying, oh, you know, there's no use cases for blockchain in financial services. It's like, well, actually, the companies are already using blockchain. It's just that you don't need to know it. Because if you do a project right, why do people need to know what technology you're using? It's irrelevant. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to technology, I think that's not relevant. But when, if they're using as the cryptocurrency for the trading or the, you know, any purposes, that quite scary way because you know the currencies are quite volatile at the moment isn't it so that could change like you know just uh, so so that, so that's where the likes of stable coins are being used uh, so a stable coin is a cryptocurrency that is stabilized in some way against another asset and that that asset might be something like us dollars or gold all might be against a basket of currencies or cryptocurrencies. And it means that it, it, it stays fairly stable in the value of it when you exchange it. So one of the problems that people will openly talk about with Bitcoin is, you know, you could go into Starbucks and you could pay for a cup of coffee and it might be like £2.50. At any moment in time, how much that is in Bitcoin is going up, down and all over the place. 
So you can't you can't really price things in Bitcoin because the, the price keeps changing so rapidly. If you've got a stable coin where it's stabilized, uh, as an example, there's one called Tether, so USDT or USDC is another one, or BNB, which is Binance's coin, they're, they're all stabilized um, against the US dollar. And so um, if you buy it and it's worth a dollar, when you sell it, it's worth a dollar. So that means that you've got something that is cryptocurrency, has got the advantages of cri cryptocurrency, you know, the fact it's recorded on Ledger, it's open, it's public in there, but the price does not change. So that solves the volatility issue. Got it, got it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it makes sense, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for that, uh, you know, sharing it. It's, it's, you got a lot of information on your head, so <laughs> thanks for that. Well, <laughs> this is it. I've, I've been involved in a number of projects over the years, and this is why I find it quite frustrating when people talk about, oh, well, no one's done this yet. It's like, well, actually, we have. It's just that we didn't bother telling you we've done it because we just got on with it. So I've been involved in a number of projects which have gone live. You don't need to, it's like saying, you know, um, does your bank use SQL Server or Oracle? You know, if you have a bank account, well, actually it doesn't matter. And you shouldn't need to know and they shouldn't behave differently. It's the same with blockchains. They're gradually getting rolled down. People aren't even noticing that they're there. So, but there are still not as many as there needs to be for the future. Sorry, Elena, I didn't say hello. Good evening to you. Hello. Uh, hello. hello. <laughs> nice to be here again. Yay, good, good, good to see you again. Have you been learning anything new in the crypto world or the blockchain world or anything lately? Um, I've been reading about NFTs over the last couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating. Uh, so many potential use cases. Uh, much to come in future. Mm -hmm. So yep. uh, yeah, and uh, and the transition from Web two to Web three. Okay. Whatever yeah. it means. <laughs> yeah, it, it was interesting. It was interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I was I was going to offer. I I heard a really good description recently about the difference between web two, web, uh, sorry, web one, web two, and web three. Uh, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, it's that web one is where things are served up on a static web page. So it's a HTML call to a web page and it's static. It doesn't change in any way. And that was web one. Web two was where you've got a call to a web page that automatically refreshes by itself and you don't have to do anything. And it also tied in with the social web and personalization and that kind of thing. So it means if you think about like um, the Binance website, the, the, the prices of Bitcoin are constantly changing. You don't have to click on refresh to get the new price. So I thought that was brilliant. That, that explained Web 1 and Web 2 really well. And then they tried to explain Web 3. And I went, I don't understand that. So for, for me, Web 3 is all about the user being in control of what they're doing and the, the user serving up data and that kind of thing. But I'm totally open to the, the whole discussion about what Web3 is. You got any good definitions, Elena? From what I'm you've been reading? <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know, Michael, have you got any view? Uh, any, any thinking about Web3? No, actually, I'm kind of curious about I think I remember you some time ago about wallets like a nano ledger is it like a tezos or something like that the treasure wallet oh, the tre tre treasure wallet yeah yeah i'm curious like i've been looking into some of these and how does it actually work because like do you have to install like a software it's like on on a it's like called i think the um met the metamask or is oh, like Met a, Met metamask and that kind of thing okay so yeah so it's it's true that when you talk about web3 you will hear comments about MetaMask, which is um, a browser add-in. So um, you use it within Chrome, and it's got its own wallet and that kind of thing. And that that is certainly along the, the Web3 journey. The, the other interesting thing, probably worth mentioning to everyone on the call at the moment, um, there was a phishing attack with Trezor today or yesterday. Um, 
So just if anyone's got a Trezor wallet, watch out. I found, found it really interesting because I got an email saying, hello, it's Trezor here. We've had a hack. Your email address has been compromised along with 106,000 other people or whatever, which I thought was fascinating given that I don't use Trezor. Um, and so this was actually a phishing email that had come out and it looked all official. And it was made to look as though it was an official warning and it was the standard, you know, click here for more details, which is where the hack actually takes place. So just beware, whenever you get emails from anywhere, never trust them, even if they appear to come from a trusted source. So that this one on the face of it looked like it was a legitimate thing. So I mentioned that as a sign. But going back to Michael's point about um, MetaMask, which is the add-in to the, the browser, and you use it typically on Chrome, I think most people tend to use it, means it's got a built-in wallet, which is quite powerful. Um, but, yeah, people do use that quite a lot with NFTs, funnily enough. Um, yeah, but it's actually pretty easy to be hacked. I, I think yeah. I got one of those like my zone and then it got hacked by some hacker. Okay. I have it, actually no idea where that came from because I actually even saw the zip phrase in the computer itself. But I think that might have been like some a malicious smart contract. Okay. I, I, w I wouldn't be surprised. I, I'm always cautious about anything that runs um, locally on your machine in some way. So if it runs in a browser, you never quite know what it's doing and who's doing it. It could be compromised and that kind of thing. So I'm always nervous about that. I think. That's why I always recommend to people, um, if you've got crypto of any sufficient value where it would like financially hurt you to lose it, then buy yourself a hardware wallet. So a, a Trezor yeah, or a Nano how Ledger. How does it actually work? I'm just curious, like, yeah. does it have to, does it like, is a separate like a MetaMask thing or does it connect with your MetaMask? So, so uh, here's an example of one with a company I'm yeah. working with at the moment. So it's, it's a it's Nano a, Ledger or? So, so this one isn't, although it's similar to a Nano Ledger. So effectively, it's um, got a USB connection, so you can plug it into the machine. And this has actually got its own microprocessor built into it. So it actually can run its own software, in effect. Um, and it holds your private keys. So it's a bit like it holds the passwords to your email address type thing. But right. you can only access... Imagine if for a moment, if we're using this to secure email then you'd only be able to access your emails with this plugged in. And this does all sorts of validation and verification. How it works in the crypto world is that your private keys are stored on this and it has to be plugged in and authorized and authenticated and you type in a code to access it and that. So you can only access your crypto when this is plugged in. So this is, this is great. It reduces the connected to, to your wallets then. Yep. So th this is it. So you, you connect this to special wallets. So it could be any wallet. It could be like MetaMask or like any other wallets. So th this actually acts as its own wallet. Oh, so it has yeah. its own, like, own proprietary wallet. Co own. Correct. Okay. Co correct, yeah. And so what that means is that if you want to uh, buy something or, sorry, pay for something with crypto, yeah. then, then this has to be connected. It synchronizes right. with the software on your computer. Yeah, and no. and it, it signs the signature, which then goes onto the blockchain for that transaction to be processed, validated, and, and paid. So what it means is that if this isn't plugged in, you can't um, make any changes to my wallet addresses or, or the, con the contents of the wallet. Sorry. And this thing, sorry, worth quickly explaining for those who don't know, because people quite often say, oh, you know, I've got this crypto wallet and it's got my crypto coins on it. It hasn't. All a wallet has got, uh, whether it's a hardware wallet like that. So is it a wallet always an online wallet? It, it, well, it, it doesn't matter whether it's an online wallet or an offline wallet for the point of what a wallet is. All a wallet does is it stores your private keys and signs your transactions. The actual value of how many Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever you've got is held on the blockchain. So th think of the blockchain as being um, a massive building filled with um, post office boxes. 
right? And, and into each of those little boxes is your crypto. And you need to use a wallet to gain access to that box to open it, to pay for things in there. So a crypto wallet, whether it's a hardware wallet or a software wallet or whatever, just holds the keys to that box that actually holds the stuff in it. Does that make sense? Right. It's but people people quite often misunderstand what a wallet actually is. I, I I did a video a while ago. If you check it out on YouTube, which is um, crypto wallets explained in five minutes, and I actually go into this about what a wallet actually does and what the different types of wallets are and how they sign is transactions. It, for example, your 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 wallet does allow you to hold like multiple currency types or. There's only like fixed a certain type. Yeah, yeah. So, so a crypto wallet is basically a um, a highly secure USB drive with software in it, and all it does is it holds data, and the data that it holds is um, your wallet details, your private keys. It doesn't hold the actual cryptos; it holds the private keys to access the cryptos. The cryptos actually sit on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So if, if you own Litecoin, Litecoin has got a blockchain. That's where the values are actually held. Yeah. And, and the wallet simply is like having a key to access those. Because that's what I'm thinking. Like some, sometimes you have the wallet, but they might not have that like connection to that chain. And then it might not work very well with, with like specific wallets. So you need to like know like which kind of wallet to, to which yeah. kind of coin and stuff like that. You're right. So it is worthwhile checking if you're going to get a hardware wallet, is it compatible with the cryptocurrencies that you're looking to yeah. deal, in, deal in somewhere? Most of them now are compatible with pretty much all the main cryptocurrencies, plus the majority, certainly of the Ethereum based crypto tokens. So it's worth differentiating slightly that a crypto token is strictly speaking not a cryptocurrency. So it's an, usually it's an ERC-20 smart contract, but it looks and behaves like a cryptocurrency. You wouldn't know any difference. And, and it's worth it if you, if you don't know the difference between a cryptocurrency and a crypto token and a crypto asset. I think I've got another five-minute explainer on my YouTube channel somewhere, which, which goes into those as well. But they work with NFT as well. I've done a NFTs explain in five minutes. Yeah, yeah. With, with, the, with the wallet work with NFT as well. Yeah, that's right. So again, all, all an NFT is, is an NFT is a smart contract-based token. So a token like any other crypto token that points to a location somewhere usually on IPFS or a file storage system. And it says that you own that asset. So again, it's, it's just like having... Um, a, a private key to the address. Mm. That's all. That's all an NFT is, which is where just usually the ERC twenty, right? Well, sometimes. Well, no. Um, for smart for NFTs, that they use a different coding standard. Um, sorry, uh, not a coding standard. They use a different reference point, which is called ERC seven two one. Okay. So, so ERC twenty is a Ethereum-based smart contract. They, they used to be used quite a lot in the ICO craze of 2017, 2018. There's a different kind of standard, which is ERC721, which is what's used for Ethereum-based NFTs. Then there's another standard, which is ERC1155, which is used for a different type of NFTs and that. So there's all these different standards. And then if you use a different blockchain, so if you use the Binance blockchain where you can have NFTs on. I think that's got some like um, BRC 20s and BRC 721s. So they kind of keep the same numbers so sometimes to make it easier. Right. Does that explain it? Yeah. 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 Much clearer. And, yeah, the, it does. And also, I have just a little question. Yeah, go for, go for it. I, I, I always love your questions because they're always <laughs> re really good, good ones. Yeah. Um, no, this time is really it's a really simple one. So uh, it really pays to own a cold wallet if you own cryptocurrency, losing which would be 
financially uh, bad for you. Yeah. Uh, but a cold wallet is just a, a secure USB which holds your private key. So I can also have my private key printed out on a piece of paper and store it in a secure place, which yep. and it will and I can call it my paper wallet. That's exactly so, what a paper wallet is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, a cold wallet, a ledger, or a treasure costs I don't know a hundred pounds. Uh, about, so, about, about, about this. Yeah. yeah, about about seventy to hundred pounds, I think they are. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but de there is definitely a point in purchasing one, isn't it? Or it, just having your your private key on a piece of paper. So, what is what is the, the point? Okay. So, so it all comes down to your personal situation. So, if you're buying and selling crypto and you're just having a bit of fun, and you've only got a hundred pounds worth of crypto it's really not worth paying 70 pounds to secure a hundred pounds. You know, yeah. um, and likewise, if you're a multimillionaire and you've got a hundred thousand pounds worth of crypto, but if you lost that, it wouldn't make the slightest bit of difference to your life. Then, you know, there have been cases of people who've got millions who don't have a hardware wallet because to them, it's not a big deal. And in fact, it was, it was fascinating that someone in interviewed on US TV a few months ago that they, they were hacked and they lost a million dollars worth of crypto and they didn't have a hardware wallet. Um, and it was kind of like, the well, that's a bit crazy. You would have thought they'd have invested in a hardware wallet, but they were just totally naive and that they, they didn't seem that bothered. And it, they just had no concept about security. So it was kind of fascinating that they were on a US TV show that was being broadcast that said they'd been hacked and they then listed off which cryptocurrencies they had, how much they'd lost and even showed a screenshot of one of their wallets. It's like, well, that's just inviting someone to go and hack you. Um, so that was kind of great. So, so for them, buying a hardware wallet was just too much trouble. So most of us are somewhere between that spectrum of, you know, a hundred pounds to secure a hundred pounds is just not worth the effort type thing. But for somebody else who's got maybe like a thousand pounds where that would really hurt if you lost it, then it might be worth paying 70 pounds to a hundred pounds for a hardware wallet. So it, it all comes down to striking a balance between how much you can afford to lose if someone steals it to how much it costs to provide that security, to how much of a risk it is that you could lose it all. Because the other, the other thing about wallets is that it's your responsibility. If I forget the password and this kind of thing for this, there's no one can help me. So I've still lost all my crypto if I forget how to access it. Um, so it's all, all a trade-off of convenience. And this, this is why people are developing wallets which are getting easier and easier to use because you know compared to banking you know banking at the end of the day you've got a mobile phone with a bank account on it and it works you don't have to worry about keys you might have to remember your passcode or your um, password but nothing more than that the bank's responsible and if it goes wrong you can go to the bank and complain and it gets sorted out with crypto mm -hmm. if something goes wrong there's nobody to go to so it's, so it's all about trade. So coming back to your original point, you're right. You could print the private keys off. In fact, there's even software that'll do it for you that'll print both the numbers and letters of the private key and it'll give a QR code. And it prints the QR mm -hmm. code, which you can then scan in. And that is your private key. So quite nice. And yeah, you know, some people do that. They print the paper and they actually stick that piece of paper in a... Um, a physical vault, you know, a physical um, safe. Mm -hmm. So, well, so from a technical point of view, a, a paper wallet is just the same as a proper whole wallet. So the, the difference with the paper wallet is most hardware wallets, you know, like, like this one and like Trezor, like Nano, I've got software built into them, 
that not only do additional val validation, but they actually sign a transaction. So when you say, I want to send Gary one BTC, it actually signs that transaction electronically to prove that you own the key. The problem with the paper wallet is you can't program a piece of paper. Okay, mm -hmm. so what you would have to do is you'd have to go in manually and type in all the details yourself of transfer this to this and that kind of thing. So a paper wallet is very, very manual. But otherwise, in terms of securing mm -hmm. it, just they're, they're... One, one thing about the, the paper and the digital wallet slightly transfer difference. So for example, if if a hacker and they eventually like hack your your like a transfer wallet, so, yeah. so so they would do that like electronically, but then would they have the approval process? Because well, they need the physical device, right? If you don't have the physical device, they can't transfer it out. Yeah. So that doesn't work in that case, is it? Well, no, and this this is why people get confused at times. So let's take it. Let's go through the levels of types of wallet you can have. So with a paper wallet, uh, so you've got it on a piece of paper. That piece of paper is stored in a safe somewhere. But say just for a minute, somebody managed to get into that safe. They photocopied that paper wallet, mm -hmm. and that, and they've now got a pop copy of that piece of paper. That gives them complete access to your wallet address. Yeah. So that that's not very secure. So that's that one out. Um, if you've got a software wallet that sits on your PC or on your mobile phone, if someone hacks into it, so you know they, they send you a lovely message to say, hello, it's um, Trezor here. Your email details have been compromised. Please click on this link and re-enter all your details, which is exactly what they, they do sometimes. If you re-enter re your passphrase and all this kind of stuff, then the hacker's now got access to your wallet. And that means that if it's a software wallet, they don't need the software that's physically on your machine. They just need the codes to access it, okay? So there's a risk with that. With a hardware wallet, people think that, oh, well, if I've got this physical device, that makes it everything safe. But all this physical device has got on it is the private keys that give you access to the wallet. Now, there's a couple of ways of, um, recreating those private keys. So when you first get um, a physical hardware wallet, you also create what is known as a seed phrase. So this is something you might have seen it where you type in 12 or 24 words. And those words are linked with what the private key is. So what people quite often do is that they'll key in the seed phrase that private keys generated and they'll take a note of those 24 words and they'll save them somewhere, okay? And then they think this wallet's physical, it's really safe and everything. What they don't realize is that if someone can get hold of that piece of paper with your 24 word seed phrase, they can then recreate your private key. And the common mistake people make is that they go and save the 24 word seed phrase in a Google doc and they email it to themselves and they think, oh, that'll be safe. So what's it, something a hacker's gonna do? If a hacker gets onto your computer, they're gonna go through your Gmail and see if they can find anything that looks like a seed phrase. And then they've got access to your wallet. And that means that having this physical device doesn't matter anymore, okay? So what you really need, and this is what this device is, unlike a Trezor or a Nano, is that what you really need is something that you have to physically plug the device in and have the keys and the passwords and everything. So Trezors and Nanos don't do that. So I, I know people who they've created a Nano Ledger, they've entered the seed phrase, they've written it on a piece of paper. Uh, they've then put their crypto keys onto the Nano and then they've taken that Nano, they've taken it to a safe which is in a security deposit vault in Zurich, which is surrounded by security guards, which has got cameras, lighting, barbed wire fences, people walking around, and they thought it's perfectly safe and completely forgot that if they've left the seed phrase somewhere, then someone can go and recreate the keys. So does, does that give a kind of a, a, a feeling of levels of security that with a paper wallet, if you let it be photocopied, it's not secure. 
with any other normal wallets, whether it's a USB wallet like a, a Trezor or Nano or whatever, um, if you lo- if you give people access to the seed phrase or the private keys, intentionally or intentionally, they can a- access your wallet. They can still make payments and that. What you really need, and these are only just coming onto the market, is something where transactions will only be signed if the device is physically plugged in. Yeah, exactly. That's the one. Yeah. So, but are these actually the wallet like Nano or is it like different kind of wallets? So, so th- th- this is next generation. This one I'm working with a company at the moment. It's not publicly available yet. Um, I think the nearest you might get is I think Copper have produced something. Which Copper's is more the secure. custodian, is it usually? That's, that's right. Uh, and they've also done so uh, some crypto custodial hardware wallets, I think, as well. Really? I, okay. I, I, I think they've got some, yeah. Um, because a lot of companies use Copper for their custodial services. Yeah. And I think, I think they might have a device. And there's a company called, I think it's QR8, based out of Israel. Um, and they've got a hardened laptop, in fact. So it's a dedicated laptop that's totally encrypted and secured, and you can only use that laptop to do uh, crypto payments and that. So at the moment, there's not like like um, hardware wallets that only when you plug it in, they sign the transaction for you. When you don't have the hardware, you won't approve the transaction. The, the, there are. Um, and in fact, Na- Nano might argue that y- you can do that, but a- anything whereby the seed phrase is available in some way, you then need mm-hmm. some additional security. So, like with, with a Nano, for example. Um, but yeah, but also, for example, like the Nano, if the hacker they took the C phrase, but they don't have the hardware, wouldn't the transaction be blocked? It, it depends how it's configured. Because the thing with a Nano is it's also got a li- little device on it where you you enter a PIN number as well, and that provides some additional security. But I think if the seed phrase is compromised, that still means that they can access the private key. And once someone can access your private key, they've got access to your wallet. But they don't have the the, nan, the, the hardware, they, so they, they can't move the funds out, right? So it, it depends how it's done. So some do and some don't. So, and I can't even remember now with Nano. I don't think you need to actually have the device. Because what, what you can do is you can do what's called a recovery. And, re, and recovery, you think about what happens occasionally with devices that you might lose it or it gets damaged you want the ability to restore it, okay? Mm-hmm. So what, what a hacker will do is that they'll go and buy a new Nano or a Nano that they've got available already. Right. They'll, they'll claim that the previous device is damaged and they'll use the seed phrase to recreate a new um, device, which has now got your private keys on it. Right. So, the, so this is the other area to be, be very, very wary of. I mentioned about securing your... Um, seed phrases. The other thing is be wary about how you back up your device. Because if you provide a backup of your device, then that's something else that a hacker could take that backup and create a new device from it. Interesting. Yeah. So this is where, uh, again, the, the firm I'm working with is looking at doing a backup which is sharded. So the backup is sliced up into pieces and is separated out. So you can't reconstruct a copy of the device without bringing sufficient pieces of the shards back together again to make so it. So basically for, for Nano, if like for example, any transaction to go through, you must have the physical device to, to approve it. Uh, you need to have a physical device. Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily- But could be any Nano physical device. However. Well, if, if someone's copied it and recovered it and made it look as though it's yours, then yeah. 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 Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I see so that, like, like the, the security. And, so it's yeah. a little bit safer than, say, a paper wallet, but, but wouldn't be like perfect, like completely safe in, in a way. So, so security is always a trade-off, and it's, it's always a trade-off between convenience, cost, and the level of security that it provides. Mm-hmm. So, it, so therefore, it, it comes down to what your personal risk profile and risk appetite is. So this is what I said before, you know, if you've only got £100 worth of crypto... Because I'm thinking, you, like, for example, like, sometimes you don't know, like, some smart contract, but you're mm-hmm. doing some, like, on some DeFi platform, and yeah. they might have a backdoor somewhere. 
yeah. and then maybe the hacker they threw the back door they get access to your wallet but then okay. in that case they don't have the hardware so they, this would be safe in a way but so so, the, so so this this, this is where you, you're absolutely right but you have to be careful if you're doing something well, for example is, in that case then the the say nano wallets will protect you then because the the backdoor hacker they have the they have the access to it but they don't have the seed phrase so no so so this is where anything that's managed through a smart contract if the hacker can work out how to exploit something in the smart contract then they don't know they don't need the device uh, example being on NFTs, uh, you know, NFTs are written to this CRC721 standard. But well, if there's a bug written within the smart contract, then there might be a backdoor exploit. So uh, a, a really crude example of that could be, I could write a ERC721 smart contract to manage a token. And within the program, it could say, if person name is Gary, then ignore all of the security checks. And then you go and buy this token, but you don't realize that the code securing the token has got this little backdoor exploit in it that says if Gary comes along, he owns it. Doesn't matter if you've got a hardware wallet, a software wallet, or whatever at that point. So this is why you have to be careful of the quality of the code. This is why um, people do smart contract audits and smart contract security checks to make sure that known bugs, known features, known problems have been dealt with and that there aren't any obvious exploits. It's never as easy as it looks, is it? It sounds like, it sounds like yeah, really complicated because then you, well, for example, you go to, to like a website, a DeFi website that you wouldn't know how safe the, the contract essentially is behind it. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what some hackers do because th th they do know what the code is and a lot yeah, of other people you, don't. For example, you're, you're, you're a user or you're just researching and then you wouldn't you'll know it. You'll, you'll never know. And there was a case a few days ago uh, with a DeFi exchange that was being used to do, I think it was doing what called atomic swap. So it swaps one crypto on one blockchain for another crypto on another blockchain. Ron so Bridge? Is it Ron Bridge? So, so, so it was a bridge of some sort, yes. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember what it was, whether it was Sushi Swap or Compound or something. Anyway, they, they, they did a hack where they managed to do an exploit. Uh, and when you were transferring from one crypto to another crypto, they kind of intercepted it and stole the crypto. Yeah. It's worth it if you Google it or Bing it or Duck Duck it or whatever your search engine. I think it's Ronnie, Ronnie Bridge. Which which bridge? Ronnie. 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 Yeah. Oh, and I, I think. Ronnie. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. Good. Well played. And this is where anything where there's multiple layers involved. So anything that involves smart contracts, anything that involves. Uh, system interactions, and this is what always worries me about layer one and layer two blockchains. Um, there are always security exploits. There are security risks at every point. And for most people who don't know any better, they're not going to realize that there is this risk until they notice that their wallet is empty. Yeah. Uh, or their NFT has gone away. Yeah. And it's like, um, go, you know, going back to NFTs, I think it was, is it Open Seas recently? Uh, so Open Seas is a big NFT. One, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think they had a big hack or something, or someone did an exploit, and they did it on the website level. And what people didn't realise was that um, there was a security risk type thing, and I think a load of NFTs were lost in some way. So I always say be very, very careful with these things. I got one simple question here. Yeah. Where can I find my token? Um, you know, that's, I got the value in the, you know, let's say in the Coinbase, but uh, where, where can I find the actual token to store? Okay. So do you know what type of token it is, first of all? I mean, it's, it's a Bitcoin. It's so, a big Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. So it's probably not a token. Is it Bitcoin as in the cryptocurrency? Ah, okay, right. So, but bear in mind two two different things here. You've got what are called native cryptocurrencies, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, Monero, 
that these are all um, cryptocurrencies that are matched against the blockchain. A token is something like, um, as we were saying before, an ERC-20 or an NFT or whatever. So if you're Bitcoin, for example, uh, you can go to something like um, bitcoin.org, it's probably a good one, or blockchain.info, and there's a blockchain um, explorer that you can go to. I don't know if, has anyone ever looked at a blockchain explorer? No? Let, let, let me um, get, get one quickly. I'll, I'll pull it up on screen. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so like Ether scan, the poly scan, the current. Yeah, it, ex exactly right. Okay. So I was just going to see if I can quickly find one. Uh, okay, so I'll just show my screen. So for those who are interested, this, this is looking specifically at Bitcoin, um, but the same works on other blockchains as well. So we go to uh, blockchain.com and we have an explorer, so Bitcoin Explorer, and we, we, we can look at Ethereum and other things as well. And what this actually shows us is the Bitcoin blockchain actually live. So these are the actual blocks that are being created. I don't know if you know that Bitcoin, it creates a block of data which gets checked by the miners and everything. Here's the data within it. And down here, it actually shows the transactions. So what you can do is if you know your wallet address, you can actually type in uh, your wallet address and it'll search for it. So if we go for an example, um, I'll just be lazy and rather than typing one in, uh, we look at this wallet address here. So here is a wallet address and we can see every transaction that's ever gone against that wallet. There, there aren't actually that many. Uh, let's see if we can find a different one. So if you, if you know your wallet address, as you, as, you, as you were saying, Sandy, you can actually go into a blockchain explorer, type it in. Okay, um, I mean, I, I didn't even know my, you know, the wallet address as well. I it, it just I simply use Coinbase to do this. So I'm just yep. curious to know, you know, where so, that so, sits in. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you go on to Coinbase, um, it should give you the wallet details about what the wallet address is. Uh, and, okay. And, you know, it'll, it'll probably start 0x something, or with these, it's BC, so... A, a I know they're carried, of... but do you actually use Coinbase yourself? Because I use Coinbase as well, but I can't find the the wallet address because they kind of hide it, I feel like. Yeah, they used to show it, I think, when I search online, but right now they keep on changing because like, if you refresh it every minute, ah. they give you a new different address. Ah, so with Coinbase, uh, this is a thing of, is Coinbase actually holding your crypto for you? I think they have like custodian. I'm not sure if they are the yeah. custodian themselves, yeah, but the, I feel like yeah, they must yeah. have like custodian or either they, they have like a separate custodian who do that. Yeah, you, you, you're right. So I completely forgot about this. So you've got what are known as custodian exchanges, non-custodial exchanges. A custodian exchange is where they actually hold the private keys for you. So you, you've got a wallet mm -hmm. and it points to effectively a pool of, of crypto in some way, which isn't necessarily yeah. yours. Uh, so it's not actually yours, so you can't actually track it down. If you transferred out of Coinbase and sent it to your own private wallet, so you could create one on MetaMask or whatever and send it to that, then it would appear on here. So, so you actually, actually, it's a really good point, Michael, that for the likes of Coinbase, you won't find the wallet address because you don't actually have the, the ownership of the coin, I believe. Yeah, it is a third party, so Coinbase acting as a... They're acting as the custodian. custodian. In, in fact, okay. Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So in order to create the private uh, pr private wallet, you're saying it's MetaMask, is it right? You, you can certainly use MetaMask. Uh, if you use Google Chrome in, in particular, or Bra I think it's on Brave browser as well. Um, and Brave is a, a more secure um, internet browser than, than Chrome. Um, then you can use a MetaMask extension 
And what that means is it'll actually build a wallet into um, your browser. And then you can use that to connect to things like um, uh, NFT platforms, that kind of thing. So if you're using some like OpenSeas, for example, or Rarible, you can actually directly connect your MetaMask wallet to your Rarible account or to your um, OpenSeas account. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, good. Good questions. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it just uh, I, I didn't see from the Coinbase that kind of see, you know the validators and other stuff. So that's that's you know find me curious but and also there is a limitations as well when it comes to the coinbase you know you can only buy certain coins and also yep. you, you know th there are yeah. some limitations but yeah so so the, the the point where it gets interesting is if you use coinbase um and you've got say bitcoin and you use it to buy something else um then you may then see a transaction on bitcoin blockchain showing the, the change of ownership at that point um but yeah, the coin, Coinbase, the, the good thing about Coinbase is that it's simple to use, but the simplicity is because it doesn't have a whole load of features that some people like and trading in other currencies and that. So I actually say to people, Coinbase um, and blockchain.info, crypto.com are all relatively simple to use, so quite good for starting with. And then as people start getting into trading or they want to do more advanced things, this is where Binance, Kraken, the, the, those kind of exchanges start coming into their own. Great. This is all part of the journey that you, you try and start off simple and then suddenly you end up in this really, really deep thing of, um, you know, oh, oh, I want to buy uh, this crypto, but it's not on Coinbase. How do I do that? And that, that's where you realize that you then have to open an account with Binance or Kraken or whatever exchange your bitcoin crypto to that exchange and convert it and it all starts getting very complicated but once you've done it a few times it doesn't seem quite so complex yeah yeah it is it is yeah, yeah. Hopefully I'll, let, I'll, I'll go up to that level <laughs> yeah. Every, everyone's on a journey I, and the the good thing about everyone on that journey is that they all started at the same point that you are at at some point People didn't know anything and that they've all had to learn and develop and they, they develop at different levels. So the, Elena, how long have you been looking at crypto and blockchains now? Um, just a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, there you go. Down. Yeah. I, I'm still overwhelmed with information. Yeah. My, my, Michael, how long have you been interested in the crypto space? Oh, about a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I got into this around about 2014, 2015, um, which sounds like a long time. But I know, I know people who were into... So you were some of the original Bitcoin maxis? No. So the, there's a previous generation, and, and they were the people who were into this in around about 2009, 2010, when Bitcoin first came out. Yeah. So you know they, they were in this space five years before I learned about it. And then people have joined five years after I got into it. So everyone's a novice at the beginning. And, yeah. and, that, and that, just, that's just a curious, uh, you know, one thing, uh, Gary, if you don't mind. Yeah. How, how did you came to know it in 2014 or 15? There is a, you know, this Bitcoin is going on. So I, I stumbled across it. Uh, I've, I've always been involved in technology in some way. Uh, and it's about information systems and data and emerging technologies. And I used to go to a lot of meetups in London and they'd be a lot in the startup community. So I, I do some stuff in the insurance startup community and learning about what's going on. And I just happened to go to a meeting where someone was talking about blockchains. I was like, oh, what, what are they? And I, I went along to this meeting and they were talking about cryptocurrencies. They were talking about identity. They were talking about security. And I didn't understand probably about 90% of it. But I understood enough to realize that this was something big and thought, oh, this is interesting. And I don't understand that. I need to go and learn about it. And so I started reading about it. I went to more meetings. And with each meeting I went to, 
I manage to understand a little bit more each time. And you, you probably find that, you know, coming along to these sessions, you know, at, at the beginning, it sounds like a foreign language in a foreign world. And then you start hearing some terms, you become familiar with them. So I was, I was exactly the same. What I found is that the meetings I went to, half the time, the people didn't explain what they were talking about because they were too technical. They were talking too detail and they were getting into Merkel trees and hashing algorithms. And I was going, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. The other half of the time was because they didn't understand either. And they'd read about it in a book and they thought they were experts. And that's why eventually I set up my own training thing for people to actually explain this in simple terms. So, yeah, I, I, I just went to a meeting. I heard about it. I realized that blockchain is ultimately, it's a protocol. It's a software protocol. And anyone knows anything about software protocols knows that there are two really important things about software protocols. First of all, they are incredibly boring, which means no one takes any interest in them whatsoever. And the second thing is that they are typically world changing. And I, I don't exaggerate that. So you look at um, this protocol called SMTP, which is what email is based on. So without that, you wouldn't really have email. That's changed things. There's a protocol called HTTP, which is the World Wide Web. So you think about how that, that has changed. And the internet, TCP IP, is the internet protocol. So these are all protocols that most people know nothing about because they're really, really boring, but the game changing. And I, I realized that blockchain at a software layer is a protocol and therefore is worth looking at. So that's why I spent six years in that space kind of thing. Folks, we're at, in fact, we've just passed our normal time. I like to try and finish around about eight o'clock. So hope you found this um, interesting and informative. For anyone who's watching YouTube, hope they've enjoyed it and they can subscribe or they can come to a future meeting. Well, th thank you everyone for coming along today. And yes, yes, thanks. Thank you so much. It's just, thanks. It's nice. Cheers, cheers as always. Have a great one. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.